Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, very glad that you could join today's session. Uh, we look forward to um, hearing uh, from our presenters and also hopefully we'll have some time to answer some questions. Today's session is on maturing immunization systems, linking learnings from routine EPI and COVID vaccinations, as you know. We will be highlighting uh, the work that we've done on AEFI uh, metadata package. And within, we will also highlight the functionality for capturing, analyzing, and mapping vaccine log logistics data, including cold chain reporting. Uh, UIO has been working on immunization uh, since 2017. And with the upcoming COVID uh, pandemic, it has given us and the world an opportunity to leverage resources to improve routine immunization programs for the long term. COVID-19 vaccine rollout has highlighted three specific needs of attention applicable to routine immunization, especially that routine immunization needs to support, needs support to maintain, restructure, and strengthen the immunization services. I would like to turn the time over and welcome our colleague and friend, um, Madhav Balakanrashnov um, from the WHO, uh, who has been working with us and partnering with us on this AEFI module. Over to you, Madhav. Uh, thanks. Uh, can you see me? Uh, I mean, can you hear me, uh, Kim? Yes, everything's good. Uh, what about the screen? Is it also visible? Yes. You are. It's very, uh, you are perfect. Excellent. So first of all, uh, thank you very much. And I want to sincerely thank the University of Oslo uh, uh, for their, uh, you know, the tremendous efforts and the work which has been which has been uh, going on for the last, I should say, as uh, uh, Kim mentioned now for the last one, one and a half years, particularly for the AEFI part where we have worked very extensively with them. And then we have also helped them to work with, uh, uh, with the DHIS2 uh, part of it. Now I'm just, I just want to, since I have approximately only five minutes, I have just two slides to show you. And, and it's going to lay the foundation from, for the AEFI module on answering one important question. And the question is, why is this happening? And why is this important? Now this is important because like in December 2020, what you see on the screen here is the new global indicator to monitor AEFI. So when you look at adverse events reporting earlier, they were reporting adverse events following immunization primarily to the, through a particular form called the WHO UNICEF JRF, the joint reporting form, which was collecting aggregate data. So every year they used to be looking at this data, probably in the month of June and all that. And then they used to do the performance for the previous years. This is what used to be happening in terms of total numbers. The biggest problem we face from WHO is just by knowing the total number of cases, it does not give information for action. Now, what do you mean by this word information for action? We get the, with this just the total number of cases. We, do, we just know there is, for instance, Angola has reported 30 cases of adverse events. But we don't know what is the 30 cases. What are they uh, cases of anaphylaxis? Are they cases of people? It was cases of convulsions and all that. And therefore, that is why the, the Global Advisory Committee, when they met in December last year, they said, let us move to this particular indicator called individual serious AEFI reporting rate in a million population from a country per year. Okay, so what we are going, what is going to happen in the next decade or the, this decade, like from 2021 to 2030, is we are going to be looking at the individual, which means case-based data on serious AEFI reporting rate in a million population per year. Where with this particular data, if you look at the numerator, we are going to be using software like the VG, the VG Flow, which is the in-country software for the regulators. And we are also going to be using the DHIS2 module as one of the solutions to collect this particular data. Now, all said and done, you should remember one very, very important thing. The data, just because it is collected by DHIS2, does not answer the solution. It has to go to the global database, which is located into the Uppsala Monitoring Center in Sweden. And I understand that pilots are already going on in Mozambique and a couple of other countries. 
And I'm really looking forward to listening to this conversation today to find out where we stand on that. The denial, so this is something which is very, very important. So we are looking at the number of individually documented serious cases for which DHIS2 is a great solution. And we really appreciate the work done by the University of Oslo in developing this as a part of the EPI tracker package. And the denominator is the total population. We are getting this data from the denominator from the UN population statistics. Okay, so this is what it is. We have got a target also for one serious case. So this is what we are going to be doing. So what we are moving to, let me tell you, what is, what is the world moving to because of COVID, like what Kim mentioned? One country, one safety data. And we are moving from one from aggregate data to case-based data in a face manner. And there should be sharing of data between all parts and all groups, like between the EPI program and the regulators. And if you see the VG base is going to be primarily used for assessing the countries and the PERFORM WHO program for international drug monitoring or the PIDM is going to be looking at the number of cases of countries reporting uh, AEFI cases to VG base. Using the JRF, we are going to be matching that. So the number of countries reporting AEFI cases to JRF is also going to be looked at. So what we are looking at is this number in bullet number one, which is coming in the part of the aggregate data and the bullet number one here for case-based data in VGBase, both of them should be similar. It cannot be identical, but at least it should be similar. That's what we are looking at. The next thing we are also looking at is number of serious cases reported to VGBase. We are also looking at it in terms of in the JRF also. And also this is the global monitoring indicator. In fact, I should have put this up in red. The number of countries reporting more than one serious AEFI case into VG base per million population. Now, this is where DHIS2 plays a very, very important role. And uh, with your efforts, and also I would like to take the full, uh, I mean, I would really like to congratulate the team in, uh, in the University of Oslo and also the HISP programs, particularly HISP India, who were involved in the development of these modules and making it quite successful. I'll stop there right now. Thank you. Back to you, Kim. Yes, thank you for that insight and um, encouragement. I agree this VigiBase, the global um, repository, is an essential component of this work based on the need to get these AFI cases um, notified and in a, logo, a larger global repository. So thank you very much for your support. I'm just going to share my screen now. And I just wanted to continue to put into context what we've been discussing um, earlier today at the low, larger uh, global uh, session and now at this plenary session. The importance of these WHO digital data packages. The context of this AFI work comes from the DHS2 WHO digital data packages. We are a collaborating center with the WHO, and in the ca that capacity, we have spent four or five years creating specific configurations of DHS2 to match WHO recommendations and guidance around data collection and analysis for key health programs. These packages come with the guidance and training materials and can be used by any country. One of the health areas that we have worked on since the beginning has been immunization. Um, we've had, we've grown quickly with the ability to ha have 45 countries use DHS2 for immunization data. 30 countries have installed the WHO EPI package. 36 countries use DHS2 COVID surveillance and response and 35 countries use DHS2 for COVID vaccine. As you can see with those numbers, it did not just happen out of the blue. It was on this foundation of what we have been working with um, in collaboration with the WO since 2017. Um, building on routine needs of immunization packages and programs and growing stronger and learning more each with each year and each package. Uh, preparing us for this global pandemic in for COVID vaccine. Um, as of right now, breaking it down further, uh, specifically to the AEFI program, 
17 plus countries are using the AFI program and are starting to work on planning on, on integration with the, the global repository VigiBase. Because of this collaboration and strong foundation of routine immunization programs, we were able to take the AEFI uh, package that is uh, modeled on WHO reporting and investigation form for AEFI with strong um, WHO recommended 25 core va variables, giving a foundation and a blueprint of this, how to have a strong adverse events following immunization. When we first started on this a, couple, a year and a half ago, it did not have anything to do with COVID-19. However, once COVID-19 came, we were easily able to um, change and integrate what is needed for COVID vaccine, um, vaccine vaccines. Within this, to give you a background and a better understanding of this global package, um, the AEFI surveillance, there is many forms associated with this um, process. However, within DHS2, we are focusing on, we have built the reporting form and line listing form, which is the key um, forms needed for data collection and therefore analysis. We have taken the the paper reporting form that was given to us by the WHO with the 25 core variables and able to put it into tracker program, uh, mimicking the what it looks like on paper to give countries an easy flow and integration into the system. We have some very strong goals for this DHS2 AFI program. We wanted to be able to integrate with routine vaccine programs digitalize at the lowest level, reduce double entry and errors through system rules, increase reporting speed, provide decision support, provide analytics through the decision chain, bring additional countries to global reporting, and to promote best practices and adherence to global guidance. However, this package has not been a plug and play uh, package. Um, this is, a, we have learned through um, the implementations that we have seen in different countries, it is always important to have that key consideration of what it takes to implement a digital package. Some of the key considerations for this package is how will this package be integrated and managed within the country's HMS and AAFI surveillance system? What is the existing data flow? At what level does electronic reporting go into DHS2? What types of devices should be used? What type of user groups require access to data, data, data capture, and admin? Uh, to me, this has been, that uh, point has been very uh, important to focus on, is to have these discussions at all levels to decide how your AFI package will look for the country use. This AFI package is a cross-program stakeholder involvement. You not only are dealing with the API program, the Ministry of Health, and the IT team, but also an important component is the National Regulatory Authority, NRA, or the Pharmacovigilance Team. And so this is an important um, implementation consideration, is that you have all the players at the table uh, uh, when implementing to make sure it will flow smoothly. As Mothav has uh, discussed this uh, package has we have worked on integration of E2B standard for VigiBase uh, to be able to we've mapped the core components of what is in the a AFI package and Vizi VigiBase uh, which is especially important for identifying global patterns particularly around new vaccines for those like COVID. We have created a working prototype to exchange the required data from the AFI module to VigiBase, and Mozambique is the first country that is working on this. We are learning from this first implementation and will upgrade our tool and guidance based on this experience. We will now turn the time over to Zeferino, the lead of HIS Mozambique, who will give us some more information about the AFI program 
uh, within the Mozambique system. Over to you, Zeferino. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, uh, evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Efrain. As I said, uh, uh, as Kim said, I'm leading the Mozambique team. So we are going to share now in the next 10 15 minutes the experience for Mozambique when adopting the, the address event for organization module. And also, uh, uh, we'll also talk about the this interoperability or the linkage. Uh, how the prototype that was developed, uh, how we consider that, and then what are the challenges and the lessons that we're learning. Uh, so, uh, so in the implementation of this module, um, so there is, there is, okay, uh, so the, the, the DHS platform, uh, it, Hello, can you, can you see? I can see your screen. It's not in presentation though, and I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Sabrina, are you there? Sorry, sorry, I was having some issues here. So, uh, so I was saying that, uh, that the DHS, sorry, the DHS uh, platform has been uh, used by Mozambique uh, uh, since 2015. Uh, the, 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 in the 2020, the Minister of Health. Uh, adopted the, 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 the WHO package for COVID-19 for case-based surveillance. And uh, last year, or this year, uh, the adverse event following organization was also adopted, special to, to, to for the, when, when the vaccine, uh, the, the COVID vaccine ad ad administration started, uh, was adopted in order to collect or to register the information related to adverse events following the, 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 the organization. And this system is currently in use uh, 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 in the national scale or national wide. We and the implementer, the stakeholders that, the, that are involved, the, we do have the, the, national, the, the Minister of Health, the, the, the HMIS unit that is leading the, the, the implementation process. We have the pharmacovigilance, which is um, within the, the, the national regulatory uh, authority, the EPI program, and also partners that are, are involved in the process. Uh, with, the, with regard to the flow, there is a beneficiary uh, that, that, that uh, reports the, 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 the adverse event. The, the true at the, at the moment it uh, is done uh, through the, 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 the manual process, which is that they, they they record and then they fill it in the paper. Uh, after that, there is a health agent uh, that uh, records that information in, in the, the DHIS2 platform. And uh, once uh, the, the, the DHIS the information is, is, is reported. Uh, the, 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 for this, there is a notification that is sent to the, the FE focal point, and also the same. The, there are four FE focal points, FI focal points at the facility. Those that also that also receive the paper forms, which they, they also send this paper form to the national level for for data validation process. Uh, the, the challenges that that uh, that, that exist uh, uh, the, during the the process, uh, the, the focus has been mainly on uh, uh, training the digital health, statistical digital officers. And uh, there were very low uh, the technical or, or A5 focal point that were trained on the platform. Uh, and and these, these, there are also duplication, uh, which is uh, I mean by manual entry of the, of the A5 uh, um, data. Uh, in the platform, there is entry in, in DHIS2 and also uh, for the historical uh, uh, historical the, 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 the uh, pharmacovigilance have been entering data uh, 
for adverse event data in VG flow. Uh, so this is process still uh, still in, in ongoing. So there, so in this at the moment we are having this this, this duplication of the, the the process. So that's why uh, there is the the, the the development of this um, uh, the interoperability. It, it, it aims to 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 cut that uh, duplication of the efforts. Uh, so, but, so by having automatic reporting, so that, that meaning that once the data is, is collected from the 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 the, 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 the is reported and the facilities, they enter it in DHIS two. That information can be sent automatically to uh, to to to, to which base. Uh, so the, the, as as the the, 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 the challenges now uh, with the, with the, uh, the what, what, from the experience uh, uh, as it was mentioned the University of Oslo with uh, they have been developing this uh, prototype that uh, the, the aims at sending this data from DHIS to 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 which, which base the, the, the database uh, so there are some um, vision challenge that uh, um, are faced for example the, the lack of coordination during the, the, the implementation of of the FI module here in Mozambique which leads to the the, the 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 low involvement of stakeholders such as the national regulatory authority and WHO in the implementation of course, they have been involved in designing the tools, everything. But when it comes to the implementation, there there is very low involvement in the in, in the process. So this is impacting on the quality of data that is sent, and impacting on the the, 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 the that we do have at the moment some records that are not reported directly into DHS two. So and then this is also related to, to the less. Um, uh, so the, foc the for example, the second bullet over here we mentioned that uh, the data reporting are focused more on vaccine delivery and less on the IF reporting. So because the, 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 the training it was only focusing on uh, the the, 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 the statistical officers that they are the one that were trained to 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 to, to report the data. So there were less um, in, uh, AFI focal points trained on the entering data into DHIS2. So, so that also there were challenges related to the devices for data collection and connectivity. This is overall for the immunization and also special for COVID and, and also for the, for the, for the, the which is uh, impacted the, 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 the adverse event following immunization data reporting. So what are the strategies that um, the country has adopted or, or is adopting? Uh, so there is a, Building capacities of the, the, the FI focal points. So that's uh, still been discussed, discussed uh, between the, the um, pharmacovigilance with WHO. There are some resources that are, we are going to use, use to, to train the, the focal points in order for them to be able to report the data. There is also a focus on data validation at national level. So, so the, this which is going to also be linked to the development or at least um, uh, creating capacity of the, the national level, especially the pharmacovigilance team. Engaging new stakeholders, for example, the call centers that will be involved on the reporting of uh, modules because they are, they, are, they are used now to, to get, uh, to interact with the, uh, client or beneficiaries on the, the COVID um, uh, surveillance. So the idea is for them also to be able to, re to report, uh, to re register that information in DHIS2 because they are using DHIS2. As is, it was mentioned here, interoperability team have been, we have been, we are, did the assessment of the, 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 the data was reported in DHIS2 and then identify the site that with more accurate data and then based on that, uh, we, is where the pilot, uh, for example, for the interoperability is happening. And also there is this local engagement between the, 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 uh, the, the, the local team. Uh, the, so engagement of local team with the, with them, when I'm talking about lo local team, the, the pharmacovigilance in South Digital, so it's Mozambique, with the Uppsala and the University of Oslo developers. There is also, uh, as part of the strategies, uh, 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 developing or integrating within this uh, the, the EFI the, the possibility of uh, uh, integrating USSD and um, SMS platform in order to get information from the the, 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 the the public so that they can this can be processed and then uh, later on uh, shared with the with the with the with the rich, rich, rich flow of the database. So the, uh, as a key activity at the moment, this is a process that is going at the moment, which is um, doing the data validation. Uh, the, all the reports, as I mentioned, 
the data that, that uh, is collected um, is also sent by paper at national level. So there is a team that is sitting at national level uh, doing data validation, check, looking at what is was reported in DHS2, going through all these reports so that uh, if there are something that is missing, can 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 be corrected, and also if there are um, it, this is going to guide the, the training. So the idea is, that as, as I mentioned, there's a train plan training that is going to happen to the AFI focal points. So that the now based on this validation, we are identifying what are the gaps, and then these gaps they are going to be used to talk to for targeting the training so that people they are able to report correctly. So, because this is going to be the basis, once it is corrected, uh, co correctly uh, collected in DHS2, so then they will be sent automatically to 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 to, VG, to, to VG flow. So that's what the, the situation at the moment here, here in Mozambique with regard to the implementation of this interoperability in the FI. Um, I will hand now to to Breno to continue the presentation. Thank you very much. Seferino, thank you very much for that. Um... A very interesting use case in Mozambique. And I think it highlights the importance of having uh, multiple stakeholder uh, involvement and also understanding um, having um, specific AFI focal points. I think the work that you have done to work on this to make it work uh, has been very interesting, adding the AFI to the call center. Um, having additional trainings, continuing to work on collaboration with communication uh, to get those and to get the report correctness uh, in place. Uh, so I appreciate that and hopefully we'll have some more time for questions. Uh, I now want to turn the time over to Breno, who is our new W or excuse me, our new DHS2 logistics lead. Um, and he will be talking on also another uh, interesting and complex component of immunization um, management, which has to do with uh, stock management and uh, mapping of the stock. So I turn the time over to you, Breno. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you to the other presenters and to all the participants. Um, it's good to be presenting here. Let me just share my screen. If you can just confirm when you can see that. Yes. Okay, great. So as uh, Kim said, I'm the LMIS technical lead uh, here at the DHS2 project since January, uh, working also closely with uh, George McGuire, who's the uh, te LMIS technical advisor, who's uh, also in on the call. So um, it's uh, been very good to, to be here and pre be presenting on this. Um, so I will uh, go over quickly um, the LMIS uh, use case and then go over to um, the triangulation of health and stock data and showing some example dashboards of that work and, and what has been done. Um, also, I'll be showing some uh, uh, mapping of cold chain equipment and cold chain monitoring and some of the work that's been done there and then end with some conclusions and a way forward. All right. Um, if you allow me first, just a quick digression then into the LMIS use case, just to sort of frame the rest of the presentation and sort of the work going forward that we foresee um, a, a continuum or a spectrum of the logistics uh, and supply chain management in country. So on the left, you have your upstream system down to the uh, facility level uh, stock management. And it's in this far right facility level that we see DHIS2 best being used to capture stock data, uh, to help with order management, to provide them performance management dashboards, which is the dashboards which I'll be showing you among them, which I'll be showing you uh, later on, and also the cold chain management and some other functionality. Um, in the upstream system, so you could do your uh, full-scale logistics management uh, using a full-scale logistics or ERP system, and really DHS2 will be suited uh, at this end user level, and there's no intention uh, to sort of uh, build it out to a full-scale system, but to really maximize this use at the end user level. So just to illustrate that, uh, if I can just show then on the left, you have your central warehouse and regional district warehouse uh, supplying medicines down to facilities. So your hospitals, your health centers and community health workers. Um, and it's at this level that we foresee then the use of DHS2 on a mobile device providing digitization of data collection. Again, dashboards and anal analytics uh, for these end user, uh, uh, end user uh, um, uh, health providers and, and others. 
and also providing temperature data monitoring features, which I'll also describe later. And then this data being connected upstream here for specifically for logistics to a, a full scale uh, ELMIS, but also DHS2 at, uh, at a higher level to allow for uh, uh, other levels of uh, an analysis of data. All right. So this is then the uh, last uh, slide then on the uh, LMIS use case. This is just the end user stock management. So this is the um, data entry form capturing stock data. And this is the data which is then used for the dashboards, which I'll be moving to now. Uh, so it's really capturing uh, based on uh, reporting periods, uh, your stock on hand, stock received, and so on, and other logistics data, which then can be compared and analyzed against health data to provide a higher level of analysis, all right? Moving on to triangulation of health and stock data then. So when we speak about triangulation, we're referring to then synthesis of two pieces of data to address relevant questions for program planning and decision-making. I think for logistics, one thing that we often talk about is having actionable uh, actions coming from, from the insights uh, allowed by uh, the dashboards and the analytics. So that's one point to emphasize. Um, so then the focus here was to triangulate data from routine aggregate health reporting and also the stock data and compare those. So usage, wastage rates and coaching data and compare those and bring those together. So the indicators were based on recommendations by WHO, UNICEF and the CDC. And then the implementation team worked to develop these uh, indicators and visualizations and then test their performance and have feedback from specific countries. So here is a first of a few examples, which I'll show. Um, when you bring together then uh, on the left side, you have a graph showing doses uh, uh, given in the green line and stock used in blue and comparing um, you know, the uh, relevance between them. You see there's a uh, discrepancy there in January and you can lead to then a follow-up and investigation to see what the issue is, if it's a data issue uh, and so on. And on the right, you have a similar comparison, uh, doses given uh, in stock use, but here now by district. On the left side, you have your national level overview and on the right, you have it by district to sort of see where you have stock issued and um, uh, consumed to compare and identify any potential issues. In addition to that, here you have the same chart in the green and blue, the stock uh, doses given and stock used. Additionally, and perhaps not uh, immediately relevant, the, the yellow and red lines with uh, 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 ending balance and uh, stock um, uh, received. Uh, but more interesting is the chart on the right side where you have your wastage rates uh, for closed vials and your wastage rate for open vials. Um, and there you can go down and identify for the specific district where you have uh, issues of um, better or worse wastage rates, and you can identify an issue which you want to follow up and see what kind of corrective action uh, you, you may do in order to improve the quality of then the, uh, the usage and the vaccination. Here then an example from Malawi for BCG stock status uh, by facility. So you're pretty much seeing um, the amount of stock with uh, color coding by facility to see where you might have an issue of overstock, adequate stock, or a, uh, a stock out situation, uh, easily color coded and it helps you identify uh, error um, uh, locations and where you might have some follow up action. So again, from Malawi, the same data with the uh, stock outs can be mapped over, uh, uh, can be put on a map to show specific locations with stock outs. So here looking at uh, BCG current stock outs, uh, in country uh, or in a district, and then uh, identifying where you might have on the right side facilities with a uh, adequate stocks or overstocks, and this will lead to an action of redistributing stocks within a similar area uh, to sort of optimize your supply chain to reduce also the risk of having a, a wastage uh, due to uh, uh, expiring items in a location with uh, overstock, and then supplying where you might have a stock out. Here is more of a national level analysis, and this is not uh, this is a, a test data. It's not a actual data, but of course you have uh, here a chart showing that you have an overstock in seventy nine point five percent of facilities. Of course, uh, a huge risk of uh, uh, of having items expiring in wastage, and then you only have one point one percent of facilities with adequate stock, and 
uh, nearly 20% with the uh, understock or, or stock out. So again, uh, the kind of like high level analysis that will help you uh, dig deeper to see where these inefficiencies are happening to improve then the distribution um, of your supplies. Here an example from Togo, uh, children vaccinated versus stock used. And this dashboard shows indicators um, as a proportion of children immunized per antigen over doses used last month. So here, if the indicator is above the limit of one, it means more children are vaccinated than doses used. And you're trying to get to as close to one as possible to improve then the efficiency of the vaccination program. And then any kind of uh, uh, issues can lead to a corrective action, such as checking for data entry error, uh, checking if stock uh, inventory data is correct, uh, checking how doses are being tallied, and then monitor and mentor facilities to make sure they understand how to properly tally and report data. So again, digging down to identify where the issue is occurring, identifying the type of issue and leading to that corrective action. Here an example again from Togo, and this is then identifying uh, under immunized children uh, by, um, by district. So then this would be to see where uh, uh, additional focus or additional, additional efforts need to, to be made in order to increase the vaccination rates uh, in specific areas. Now, moving on to cold chain equipment monitoring. Um, now this was uh, based on examples from both Mali and Togo. And this is an example showing um, where there has been a cold chain disruption in the last three months. Now this is based on manual reporting and I'll get to it after, but there's some issues with the quality of data coming in, but this at least gives an overview of the sites um, where you had a number of disruptions per month and then identify where maybe you need to also uh, conduct some corrective action. What is the reason? Is it the quality of the equipment or, or misuse of the equipment uh, in order to avoid any kind of damage to, uh, to, to stocks and to vaccines? And similar here, identifying, uh, showing the same information then over a, a map and uh, uh, using a DHS2's uh, uh, map functions to then highlight where you have greater uh, issues and disruptions uh, with the cold chain. You have a larger and darker red dot. A few of them are very uh, nearly not visible and very light. That might be a less significant issue. And of course, you can set thresholds for these and then identify this is where I need to uh, conduct some corrective action, do an assessment. Uh, maybe change equipment um, in order to provide proper uh, cold chain capacity in, in that facility. And here is another type of analysis then for the cold chain. And this one here is really showing um, the temperature alarms uh, over the past 12 months. And then it's divided by uh, regions and showing here quite clearly that the more uh, central uh, regions closer to capital have less alarms, whereas the more remote um, a region has more alarms. And this is kind of confirming um, an assumption that more remote locations will have uh, bigger issues with um, maintaining and keeping proper cold chain uh, capacity. So now some issues specifically to the uh, cold chain equipment monitoring. It was, uh, as I mentioned with Molly, that um, data was not being captured from all um, uh, refrigerators in a facility, but only one or two. So this, this did not give a full image of, of the site. Whereas in Togo, they were reporting on um, on all um, item, on all refrigerators in in the site, or whether they could keep vaccines. Uh, the attempts to reconcile the data in Mali were to use predictors for the number of refrigerators in use, um, or use the number of refrigerators as a denominator. But this really led to just approximations. And again, the overall challenge here being that there's divergent practice, practices around the cold chain monitoring. And um, it leads to a high customization of packages in any one context, and which then will connect to some of our uh, conclusions and way forward. Uh, so first, the conclusions. Um, I mean, it was a relatively um, uh, generally agreed that the dashboards can be relatively easily developed and easily used by stakeholders for data monitoring and analysis. Uh, this was uh, more or less across the board. Um, the tables and graphs in the dashboard are regularly used by data managers at the central level. As I showed, the different levels of analysis allow them to make decisions and corrective action to dig deeper and find where specific issues were 
um, uh, and then deal with those if it's either a question of data or, or a question of practice uh, that they could remedy those. Um, it would allow data managers to easily spot data coherence issues in the system and determine which facilities need targeted support. Again, repeating what I said there. Uh, and more or less the conclusion, uh, and this is um, uh, straightforward, that we'll look to continue to develop the dashboards triangulating health and stock data. It's proven to be um, a useful endeavor, and this is only sort of scratching the surface of what is possible. Uh, there's also possibilities related to uh, predictive uh, forecasting and how you forecast stocks based on health data coming into a site. So there's still a lot of work to be done, and this is only um, sort of the tip of the iceberg of what can be done within the field. Um, and then ongoing work as well within uh, the LMIS team here now at DHS2 is uh, development of the automated temperature data monitoring tool through Bluetooth uh, temperature sensors. So it's both guidance and uh, design of, uh, of the solution where you would then rather than have the manual reporting, uh, rather have uh, automated uh, sensors and automated alarms to manage uh, cold chain equipment. Um, so those are some of the conclusions and way forward. And just, yeah, contacts if there's any questions or comments and also question or comments here. Um, and back to you, Kim. Thank you, Breno. That was very interesting. Um, and I think you highlight it well that um, this is the tip of the iceberg and it's interesting um, how the devil is in the details. Um, we have a, people are working towards a goal, but then it's really a refinement process. And I think that is, uh, the strength of DHS2 and the DHS2 community is to have this communication to be able to further dive deeper and make solutions uh, for these issues in country and using global information. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions. We have until um, 55, uh, 5 till the hour, and then we will be closing the session uh, and we will be able to continue the converse uh, an immunization conversation uh, in the next session. So you can stay on the uh, line if you'd like to continue with that. And I also like to highlight that Breno uh, has a session later in the week to dive deeper into the LMIS work with DHS too. Um, I see Mike has his hand. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's uh, really interesting. I appreciate the, the presentations. Um, I was going to ask specifically to Zeferino and to, to the Mozambique use case. I, I know that uh, you were some of the early adopters and have had to be not only the early adopters around the AEFI package, but also doing this link to Bigibase. I just wondered it, at this point, if you were able to start over again, and for some of those countries that are just starting now, uh, what what would you recommend? What would you do differently to maybe avoid some of the problems that you described uh, now that you've learned from this process? Uh, th thank you, Mike, for the question. Um, uh, in fact, uh, we are uh, one of the point point here that I highlighted is the coordination mechanism. I think uh, one of uh, we do, when when we started in, in the implementation of the COVID vaccine package here in Mozambique, everything it was it was on not only the the the, the adverse event. I think even the the, the, the vaccination process, the HMIS unit was uh, involved in the process very late. So they were not uh, they, they were not well organized. They did not know what is needed to to to, to successfully implement the, 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 the package. Yeah. So I'm talking about implementation, not only the digital, but also the tools, everything. So uh, having this coordination mechanism in place where everyone is, is, is on board and then they know their role in the process. It will, 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 will improve the, the, whole, the entire process. You, for example, uh, the training, uh, it was during the COVID, the training happened, it was virtual training, and then it was only in two days training. So, and then the focus it was uh, with, with the, the, as I mentioned, that entry, the, 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 that the statistical officers, uh, the one that we are using DHS2, the, 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 the Adverse event follow the focal point. They did not use DHIS2 before, and then they were not involved in the training in the first place. So the idea was the data was supposed to be entered by the statistical the statistical office. 
But uh, when it comes to place, we, we found that the, because of the other challenges, they were only focusing on the um, on reporting the, 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 the number of people, the people that they were vaccinated, not looking at the, the, the adverse events. I think this coordination, uh, the coordination mechanism that it need to be put in place. Of course, the tool it was there, uh, and yeah, and and then having also the the national or pharmacovigilance or national regulatory authority uh, in the in, engaged in the in the implementation. Uh, also, but of, they were they were in the meetings, but uh, when it comes to the in having them in the ground, having the uh, address event following immunization team reporting that they were not they were not following that. I think uh, it's it, the training and also having this coordination mechanism in place will be one one thing that um, uh, it will make things more easier. Um, uh, yes, yeah, we, we are. Yeah, that's what I can I can say. I think that uh, what comes to my mind at the moment. I no, I, yeah. I think that's that's great advice. I, we we of course. So I'm I'm also with the University of Oslo. For those that don't know, we we're always trying to learn better how to kind of make these uh, adoption of the metadata packages uh, an easier process. And we're often asked, you know, how how much time does it take to adopt one of these packages? Usually, I think that question is from people that are wondering about the technology, and the answer to that is very quickly. Uh, you can install a package, you know, in a day. Uh, but what what takes a lot more time is this coordination aspect. And and it to me, this this one in particular, AEFI, where you really need to have both the immunization programs and the pharmacovigilance programs, and potentially different cadres of workers involved takes, I, I think, even uh, potentially kind of new connections that maybe you haven't previously had to, to bring together before in the work. So yes, I think that's a really important lesson to learn. It's something that we, we try to stress now in the guidance uh, for the package and, and uh, recommendations on how, how to go about implementing it. But, but it, to me, it's very similar to another one of the immunization interventions we've done, which is to try to link the reporting of some of the vital events uh, that are noticed first in immunization programs, so like birth notification. And again, this is one of those areas where you're trying to link kind of the health program to those that are responsible for the vital events. And uh, often these linkages don't really strongly exist uh, previously. And so, so plan for some extra effort, I think, there and trying to make sure that there is coordination and decision making uh, level people can be involved in the conversations from the beginning. But yeah, anyway, Zephyrino, thanks for thanks for sharing that. And uh, of course, we're, we're happy to continue supporting you. This is Mozambique's implementation is one we really want to learn from and continue to improve the tools with. So yeah. What, what, so, so Mike, before, what, what, another point that uh, uh, which is also important uh, for, for for example, in my last slide, I showed the picture where there is a lady sitting with the uh, forms that were sent were sent from the, the, the from the, the vaccination points to the national level. What they what what the team is doing is that they, they are taking that doing the, the the data quality check. I think, of course, it's linked to the to, to the, the, the the coordination mechanism. But we, we need there's a need of having this team that can go there and then revise. Not only one thing is to report the data, but at some point you find some uh, some aspects. For example, that when they are filling it, they can make some mistake that uh, they select one uh, district. For example, we did find some that they were, they were not. Uh, selecting the right facility, they are adding their facility, but uh, which is linked to this uh, different district. So those decisions, uh, when it comes to the, with, with the when they report it in the paper base, you need to go there and then check whether they report it to the right facility or not. Because sometimes the, those that are collecting that are entering the forms, they are not the one that are going to enter data in the system. So you need to have this uh, data quality uh, team. Uh, this, they, this is coming from the experience that we had in, in San Tome, for example, after the first round of the, 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 the vaccine, uh, then we, we did evaluation of the process, then we decided when in the second, well, we, we, to set up a team that could do the data quality check before uh, the, the, the vaccination ends, because we did, after the first round, we did have two weeks just doing data cleaning. So in order to avoid that, uh, in the second round, we decided to have a team that would, could get 
whenever the data is reported or the, on daily basis, they can get the forms and then check that everything was reported in the system. They, they have selected the, the vaccine, the, the dose, the vaccine dose, whether they have reported the date, the date and the time that, that the vaccine was, was, was uh, adm administrated. So that this information is very key for the, when you are doing the reporting of adverse event. And then in some, some of the forms, they did not have that information. So it, it was very important to have that on daily basis because if you leave it, and then it, it will take time. Uh, you, you won't be able to get that information uh, if you take one week or that because it's difficult sometimes to contact the person. So that is just adding some components of how, having the team that can do the data validation while the validation or the, 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 the vaccination process is ongoing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a great, great point as well. So we, we have uh, the, the tracker implementation guide from the University of Oslo that talks a little bit about kind of the differences between uh, an evaluation and ongoing monitoring system and maybe some of the key uh, structures to put in place around data validation. Because these things, especially at the beginning, uh, there's a lot to be learned about how the users are entering data, what they're missing, what is the quality of what they're entering. But you also want to make sure you design a process that will lead to some reduction in the workload. So you, you don't want to have some very overburdensome process that will last forever because that also drives down use of the system. But meanwhile, you do need to have confidence in the system. You need to know the data coming in are really good. So, so there is a lot of thought that should go into that about, especially when you're rolling this out to begin with, how do you double check? How do you know that the data are quality? Are there people that you can train for that purpose? How long should that approach run on for? Will there be a kind of longer term monitoring approach? So yeah, a lot, a lot to be considered there. But uh, yes, thanks. That was that was really great. I, I saw also in the community of practice a question from uh, Suleiman. Um, I don't know if uh, Monhav is still here with us, if he'd want to address that. The question was about whether this is a change in policy for WHO to be reporting adverse events from the routine system, or he, it, it felt like previously there was more of an effort uh, placed on mass campaign reporting. Um, I don't know if you want to address that, uh, Monhav, if you're still around. Maybe he isn't still around. No, I think he left actually, but uh, maybe you can address it in the community practice. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to come back with a specific answer from WHO on that, just to say that actually, I, I don't think this represents a significant change in the WHO recommendation. The, they, they already have, at least we did some mapping of the DHS2 countries and the vigi based countries countries, and there was an overlap of at least 40 countries uh, that are using DHS-2 for immunization and that are expected to report to Vigibase. Um, so this is something that has been recommended for some time through the routine system in addition to mass campaigns, with the idea being that adverse events are actually fairly rare, they don't happen regularly, and any individual country, the, the data that they have is not quite as strong as being able to bring it together into a global repository. So if you're seeing a, a you know adverse event one in ten thousand, the the pattern doesn't stand out very strongly in a single country. But the global repository is necessary to track down if there's an actual vaccine problem. But uh, yes, we can see if we can get a, a better answer to that question. Yeah, and, uh, my last question is to uh, Zeferino. Zeferino, uh, shifting gears and going to um, cold chain mapping. Uh, you are part of a uh, small implementation, and I think in South uh, Saint Tome. Um, how w was it for you to be able to get the coordinates into the maps for the cold chain mapping? Um, hope that doesn't put you on the spot too much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I was part of that the team that we did, we did that uh, activity in Saint Tome and Guinea Bissau. So the idea was to to have this uh, triangulation done, uh, which uh, with the aim of um, helping the EPI programs to monitor the situation or the the the, the, the vaccine or the the, the, the all, all yeah the demonization situation to uh, to monitor that. And um, what we have what we did in in in, in Santa Maria before in the, they did not have the coordinates, so we got the, the, that information from the. The, 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 the team, the HMIS, uh, they provided that coordinate and then we, we input it there in the system. Similar uh, from Guinea-Bissau, we got it uh, from 
uh, HMIS, but special that was uh, UNICEF, uh, that uh, team that that was working on WASH project that provided the, the coordinate and then we updated the system and then based on that we are able to uh, get some information because uh, the, 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 the two the, the system they do have they did have or they do have uh, mechanisms of reporting uh, stock uh, situation and also uh, the, the cold chain uh, the, 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 the whether the, the, the fridge that is uh, operational or not. So based on that, we did a mapping in the system and uh, we are able to show them uh, how they could uh, use the, 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 this uh, the, the mechanism in the in the day to day on the day to day basis. Uh, based, uh, for example, if I go to Guinea Bissau, for example, now uh, they are we, we are expanding that based on that we are doing what they we call including within the real time monitoring indicators that will allow uh, those uh, individual at facilities to report uh, the, the stock situation uh, not only waiting because they are reporting on monthly basis. So to avoid that waiting until the end of the month, they will be able to, to, to report both the, the situation of the, the, the stock as, as well as the, the, the fridge, whether there is a problem so that they can send that information on, on, on real time. And then the, the decision can be taken if it's, for example, to move um, the, 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 the vaccines from one um, freezer, for example, to another in the, in the near neighborhood health facility, those things can be done uh, on, on, on real time at, at least in said and this will avoid for them them losing some of these vaccines that need to be uh, within uh, the freeze for uh, some some time you know, the, the, yeah uh, that see yes that was the 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 the, the plan or the, the all what you have done and then what the the the, 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 the idea or the objective of doing this triangulation in these two countries thank you Severino, thank you for your sharing your experience. I just want to close this session and say thank you to everyone uh, for being here and for presenting. And it really does take a village and a community to create a mature immunization system. And I thank you for your learnings and sharings and continue the conversation in the COP. And we'll go ahead and leave the session now. So stay tuned if you'd like to continue to listen with Anna and team.